In this episode of Idea City. So remembering the lessons I'd already learned, I wanted to design a new vehicle that was not geeky in the slightest. I did a number of different sketches, and I learned from the reactions I got from different people that people really seemed to react well to the unicycle look. Also, what the Central Industry Hub is meant for is for all the pretty much the offices or the factories of this space settlement. It's meant to support the economy, and the main economy here would be spacecraft manufacturing and zero gravity research. So in our working notes, we call this session Get Moving. Now we're moving into modern ways of getting moving. So if you'll have a look in your program book, uh, find the page for young Mr. Gulak. Gulak. Who? There you are. Okay, Ben. I was hoping you would drive it on stage, Ben. So come on up and tell us where your... Uh, one-wheeled motorcycle is. Well, <laughs> so the actual bike right now is down in Boston. We're in the process of building a new prototype, and I mean, we just couldn't get up, get it up here for the show, unfortunately. Right now, it's still 25 miles an hour, but the new one we're building is going to go 40 miles an hour, and we're hoping to have that one start hitting bike shows by the end of the summer. Did you bring some pictures with you? Oh, yeah, there's a slideshow that goes with All that. Right. So carry on. Your guys are probably going to be sick of it by the time I'm done up here. <laughs> so, good afternoon. It's exciting just to, be, uh, just to be attending today. I still can't believe I'm standing up here. The reason I'm here, which actually started with the high school science project, is a huge surprise to me since science and engineering were definitely not my favorite subjects, though I think they might be now. I'm 20 years old, originally from Milton, Ontario. I'm currently a freshman at MIT studying mechanical engineering. I'm here because the... I'm here because the UNO, often described as the world's first unicycle motorbike. In fact, the UNO actually has two wheels side by side. It travels at speeds up to 25 miles an hour, but the speed of 40 is in sight. The machine is self-balancing because of its gyroscopes. It can take any weight and is small enough that you can fit it in an elevator to bring up to your apartment or dorm. But maybe best of all, the Uno is entirely electric and green. It doesn't use a single drop of gasoline. My dad owns a company in the food industry which sells machines all over the world. That summer, he made a business trip to China and brought me and my mom along. While my dad was in meetings, my mom and I toured the city. Three cities, in fact. Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. You know when you fly into a city and you look out the window and you see the whole terrain laid out below? Well, just before I passed through the clouds in China, that was the last time I ever saw the sun. There was so much smog over all three cities that there was never a clear day, never a clear sky, and never a starry night. It really hit me how bad the pollution really was. I remember reading a story in the newspapers over there how every day 20,000 new cars were hitting Chinese roadways. And I couldn't help but wonder, with so many new people buying cars, what would the global impact be? What if everyone in China were suddenly driving a car? And that was a big realization for me. There was another way, too, that our trip had an impression on me. I noticed that aside from all the bicycles that were on the roads, there were just as many mopeds, motorcycles, and scooters, all burning gas. People were attaching little two-stroke engines to anything with wheels and driving it on the road. Again, all creating pollution. There should be a greener version of transportation like that, I thought. Something small and compact, but better for planet Earth. I couldn't shake the memory when I got home. All of that pollution. So I started sketching ideas for a new type of vehicle for next year's science fair. I was already aware of the EV1, the electric car produced by GM 10 years earlier in 1996. It was a perfectly fine-looking car, but it definitely wasn't cool. And that had to be one of the reasons why GM discontinued it only a few years later. I was also aware of the Segway, the two-wheeled, self-balancing scooter, widely touted as the future of transportation. However, it's been pointed out by others, as in the book Codenamed Ginger, that the Segway turned out to be a major disappointment, only a niche product. In fact, as of March of this year, 
Segway officials said that the company has only sold 50,000 units worldwide. What had struck me and many others was that from a marketing standpoint, the Segway just didn't look like the future. <laughs> or even sexy. <laughs> but cars and motorcycles are more than just transportation methods. So remembering the lessons I'd already learned, I wanted to design a new vehicle that was not geeky in the slightest. I did a number of different sketches, and I learned from the reactions I got from different people that people really seemed to react well to the unicycle look. So now with my partner at the time, I started to build a new prototype, the machine under the skin. It was actually ridiculously ugly, with brackets welded onto it and batteries lashed onto the sides, but that's what we submitted to the science fair. And we ended up being picked to go to ICEF again with Team Canada, this time in Albuquerque, New Mexico. By the time we got there, we'd refined the prototype again. Now it was called the UNO, and this time we won a second place award. But more importantly, we won the award for the project with the most marketability and real applications in the, in the world. So I decided to take a year off from school to keep working on the UNO. That summer, I finished the bright orange shell. Everything was done on a shoestring budget. I let the painter put his logo on the bike so I wouldn't have to pay him. The fiberglass people put their logo on it so they didn't get paid. I mean, the thing was like a NASCAR with all the stickers on it. <laughs> Another lesson I've learned is the value of luck. I know I've been lucky. Popular Science was going to run a small one-paragraph story on science fairs. But by the time they had the thought and the time of their actual deadline, the design of the UNO, and I guess its coolness factor, progressed to a point where they wanted to brighten its spotlight. I was glad that I'd continued to develop not only the technology, but also the look of the vehicle, because by the time the magazine's deadline approached, they thought it was now photogenic enough, especially with its shell on. The popular science coverage grew from a single paragraph to invention of the month to the cover as one of the top 10 inventions of the year. At about the same time, I'd entered the UNO in some local motorcycle shows, where it caught the eye of Motorcycle Mojo magazine and the famous bike builder, Russ Mitchell. The incredible result? Two magazine covers, both in the US and Canada, just days apart. That brought media in from everywhere, with calls from all the British newspapers, the BBC, and online blogs. When we come back... Suddenly I knew it was time to start raising money, which taught me another lesson. The value of support. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com. The popular science coverage grew from a single paragraph to invention of the month to the cover as one of the top ten inventions of the year. Suddenly I knew it was time to start raising money, which taught me another lesson. The value of support. First, speaking of luck that one can't control, I was more than lucky with my choice of parents, Ken and Sylvie. <laughs> it would have been all too easy to give up along the way, but their support was never wavered and it stoked me on. Next came the need for money. At the age of just 19, I'm still not considered a sure thing to invest in. <laughs> So I had to be open to some pretty unconventional ways of fundraising, like appearing on TV shows, going on Dragon's Den. And as nervous as I was for how it might have turned out, the results were pretty exciting. Here's a highlight. The product is the Uno, and my company is BPG Technologies, and I'm looking for one and a quarter million for 15% of my company. One and a quarter million for how much? 15%. You didn't say 50, you said 15? No, 15, one five. Okay. It better be good. Is it real? Like, it's real? Like, you, this, you built this? this? This is a real life-size prototype. It is so cool looking. Oh, oh thank you. I, I did all I the mean, design it's so work cool. myself. Okay, Ben, we've talked about it. I think it's unanimous that we believe in you, and we're comfortable doing the deal at one and a quarter million for 20% of the firm. Do we have a deal? We have a deal. So that was one year ago this month. Since then, I'd better get used to it, there's been some ups and downs. One of the ups from all the media was an invitation to a... <laughs> a 
I was pajama parties at the Playboy Mansion. I guess I really have to thank Mr. Levy for making me do that first science fair. <laughs> Among the downs, however, was the recent economic meltdown in September. One investor I'd found now had to pull out, and I'd still not received any funding from the Dragons. T times were really tense, and I didn't get the check from the Dragons until just four months ago. Finally, that made it possible to open our office in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and hire a full-time team of people. We have an industrial designer, a control systems expert who's a former MIT prof, another PhD in mechanical engineering, and a CEO with experience with tech startups. More than ever, I believe in the importance of working from passion. In the middle of a stressful time, it's really important to believe in what you're doing and genuinely be excited about it. I've learned never to let people convince me I can't do something I believe in. And even though I go through periods of self-doubt, you can't let others encourage that. As I said, I've learned the tremendous value of support. When I started this journey, I was in grade nine without a driver's license. It was my mom who drove me to the machine shop and waited in the cold while I was inside working on equipment. This is the first presentation I've done to an audience like this, so I thank you for all being so nice. For, <laughs> for me, the real excitement wasn't being up here on stage, but getting the chance to meet and interact with all of you and learn from your stories. I wish all of you tremendous success with your dreams. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> thank God that's over. Take it out. First question, mm -hmm. have you met Dean Kamen? Has he driven on the Uno? I haven't met Dean Kamen yet, actually. We've sort of been putting that off for a while, but I'm planning on meeting him this summer. Is, is the transport mechanism, mechanism pretty much what it is on the Segway? I notice you lean in the same way and yeah. One of the things is out. the new prototype we're designing, because yes, there were quite a few similarities with the original design that everyone's seen. Um, we've just finished filing a whole bunch of new patents that help break away from some of the Segway issues that we would have had. So, uh, I mean, we're not sure where it's going to go yet. And uh, next question. The, the dragons came in with all their money finally or not? Unfortunately, no. I mean, there's a, a difference between reality TV and the real yeah. life. <laughs> uh, but that's shameful. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just one of the things I had to deal with. And the, re the recession was one so of the So how much money did they come up with? Finally? Brett Wilson ended up coming in with a quarter million. Quarter million. And we, we came up with some other money that was enough to move fully forward. Did he get a piece that was pro rata, or did he renegotiate it, it? No, it was still, I mean, we kept it at the original rate. The deal mil. that we negotiated was at the uh, six and a half million valuation, which is what he invested in. And did you keep the other 80%? Yeah. Oh boy. All right. Thank you. When we come back. Uh, we also have here a panoramic observation hallway that allows you to look into things in the space to allow you to really look and take the view of the Hubble Space Telescope, but for your own eyes. Get the latest Idea City news instantly. Follow us on Twitter. Our next speaker is a fellow who uh, just won the grand prize in the NASA 2009 International Space Settlement Design Competition. His name is Eric Yam. <laughs> He's 17 years old. I'm not sure I need to say anything more than that. Eric, come up here. Tell us what you're up to. Thank you. Oh, that's a picture of me, I look too smug in that one. But basically how I wanted to start off was to look back really at the fact that Idea City is in its 10th anniversary. And I think from this point on, I'd like to think about well, what would we like in its 100th anniversary. So hopefully by that 100th anniversary we'll be in space. And once in space, how can we live in there? So with that design in mind, or with that thought in mind, I give you Aston, which is about my project, which was uh, for the NASA competition. 
So it's divided actually into three sections. It's called the habitation region, the central industry hub, and interspatial structure. Given that it's in space and you can't travel back to Earth very easily, it's pretty much a city in a building. So the habitation region can be further subdivided into what we call habitat modules, which are the tiny blue dots you see on there, uh, ring hallways, which are the white circles, and then finally the vestibules, which are giant white boxes. The central industry will go on later on. Some basic dimensions of what it would be like, what would be necessary. We have a total height of 1,700 meters. To compare that in relative terms, that's about three times the height of Toronto CN Tower. Overall diameter is about 1,000 meters, which is about twice the size of Toronto CN Tower. So now we go on to the habitation region, those blue dots you saw on the outside of the cylinder. What does that look like specifically? So, in fact, the basis of the entire design, the main is a modular component that actually was developed by NASA in 1994 called the TransHab Project. Now, what this essentially is, in reality, is just a giant balloon. And the only thing is that multiple layers of balloons. Now, what this balloon is, is it's inflatable, pretty much. So it's, in our case, can be used as a habitat. It's actually already been launched in space. If you, anyone has heard of Bigelow Aerospace, it's owned by a, a CEO of a hotel chain. He pretty much took these designs from NASA, built them and launched them to space, and they're right now floating above our heads at this minute. So it's already been developed, it's already been in existence, but what does it look like on the inside? So this is pretty much what the st structure looks like on the inside. It's pretty hard to understand it, but basically it's the same structure as a jet fuselage. So the airplanes that you fly, maybe between London and Toronto, it's the exact same structure. So there's no need to go and try and develop something new that would support the whole thing. It's already been developed. So then these ring hallways then connect what we call vestibules. And this is pretty much those white boxes you saw in the previous picture, orient them sideways and cut them in half. That's what they look like in the center. Now what these vestibules are is essentially community centers. Everything you need to support life can be found on them. Uh, inside cross-section, there's about four different layers. And if we go to the next picture, I'm not sure if it's working too well. If we go to the next picture, we can see the inside, specifically the four different layers and what can be found on each one. Because it contains both life support and community services like parks and, and education facilities and whatnot, you've got a bunch of things you can do there. So first level, you can do uh, agriculture. I'll talk about that later. Second level is everything to do with community purposes, education. Third and fourth level is for mechanical purposes to keep people alive. <laughs> okay, so that's what the inside of the habitation region looks like from the inside of the entire cylinder. You can see the habitat modules connected to the ring segments, which then connect themselves to the vestibules. So then after that, we're going to now look at the central industry hub with a giant cylinder in the center. Now, if we were to take that cylinder out and to chop it in half with a giant knife, what we'd get is something that looks like this. So what the central industry hub is meant for is for all the pretty much the offices or the factories of the space settlement. It's meant to support the economy, and the main economy here would be spacecraft manufacturing and zero-gravity research. But when you fly up to Earth and you dock at these docking channels using either space planes or rockets or whatever, and you, is, you leave your plane and you enter, and you enter what they call central corridor, which is just essentially a long hallway that you can float down. So, as you float down, you pass by the Space Hotel, which is where we would hold our 300 visitors. Uh, we also have here a panoramic observation hallway that allows you to look into things into space, to allow you to really look and take the view of the Hubble Space Telescope, but for your own eyes. So as we continue down, we pass by the main research areas, the main manufacturing placements, and uh, given that it's in space, Probably the best option for an economy would be uh, spacecraft manufacturing, developing solar power satellites to, for renewable energy purposes, b uh, bigger spaceships, bigger satellites for telecommunications. That would be actually the basis of the entire economy on the station and would help fund off its $563 billion cost. So if we go into the next one, we then would go into specifically the interspatial structure, or if you want to imagine as a giant wheel, the spokes. So if you were to take out those spokes, and pull them aside, you would see that that's pretty much what they look like. But in fact, uh, they're essentially elevators. But actually, only a few of them are elevators. And if you look, that's what the elevators look like. If you were to turn those on the, to their side and look at them straight on, uh, it's double duck elevators, turn that upside down, and that's what it looks like on the bottom. But the ones that aren't elevators are what we call adjustable gravity labs. What you can do on them is a whole bunch of things. You can estimate, uh, uh, do experiments on moon's gravity or Mars' gravity or anything between zero and one G. But really, but I think the most important thing here to recognize is that although it's a nice design, everything isn't out there, I have to realize that it's never going to be built. Now, the reason is not because of the technological errors. It's not because of the fact that it can't be done because of you know, feasibility or money problems. It's the fact, it's the lack of dreaming. 
And I think that's a problem that we see really with today's youth, specifically as a youth. Um, we have, as in the past 40 years, the people who have been working on the space, uh, the space systems, you know, all the, the space designs, have been mainly the people who worked on Apollo. The, the fact that we couldn't be able to put a man on the moon, it's really sort of died down in terms of our generation. In fact, what we see now is everyone saying, oh, the, we didn't even land on the moon in the first place. So, so to get that sort of cynicism from the youth of today's, uh, uh, today, which will be uh, your caregivers in the future, deeply saddens me <laughs> and disappoints me. But like Michelle Rainey says, there is hope. There is the dreams is really what Idea City can bring. And I think dreams is something that I'm really interested in. And I really have the dream of exploring space. I really hope you guys have the dream of exploring space. And I hope you pass it on to your children and everyone around you. Because in reality, when everyone believes, dreams become reality. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're quite something, Eric. <laughs>